Next Sunday, we have a missionary with us, Don Triplett, who is a missionary to El Salvador. He leads King's Castle Ministries there, and our students went last summer. We took a group of students several years ago to work with King's Castle, and uh, the triplets are going to be here with us next Sunday. Excited for that. We've got a trip going to El Salvador, and uh, we're just excited for him to be here with us, and uh, so be praying for that. Uh, the Kind of the theme is uh, miracles. There's a lot of miracles, and even the times that I've been there, I've seen uh, people healed. I mean, just physical, like visual healings, like right in front of us, and so we see God doing some amazing things there. He's going to be telling some stories of of what's happening with the ministry there, and Sunday night he's going to be sharing as well, and uh, we're just having a miracle service of asking God to to perform healings and work miracles among us, so be praying for that, and be sure to be here. It will be a a tremendous time of ministry, so uh, you didn't know who was preaching today when you showed up, but next Sunday you do, and I would encourage you not to miss next Sunday. You will not want to miss next Sunday, so there you go. We're finishing our series today that we started way back at the beginning of December, kind of a Christmas series called It's a Wonderful Life, and today is number six of that, and I started at the beginning of December, concluded today. We've been talking about a lot of different uh, subjects in this series, and some of you might say, well, it just doesn't seem like a Christmas series, but all these things that we've talked about are, are, are issues, I think, that we all maybe struggle with, face on a regular basis, but certainly around the holidays. And you can see every one of these um, topics that we've shared uh, from fear, worry, anxiety, busyness, guilt, shame, loneliness, depression, uh, and today we're talking about disappointment. You can see it throughout the, the Christmas story in the Bible. The incarnation of Jesus coming to earth, God in the form of man, changed everything. He brought hope and he brought uh, a purpose to free us from the bondage of slave, uh, from the bondage of sin, and so that we can be fr- free from all of these things. So today, talking about disappointment, uh, I wonder if you've ever used this phrase, that's not what I expected, which is the precursor to feeling disappointed. This is not what I expected. I don't know if you remember as a kid uh, ever wanting something for Christmas so badly that you even said these words, I, I promise that I'll never ask for another thing <laughs> if I could just have this. Any of you would say maybe you've been there before. Only to get that thing in just a short while, you realize that uh, that's not what I expected. Disappointment. Even as adults, we um, maybe certain things that we want, a new truck or a new car or buy a new home, um, Maybe a, a new job or whatever it might be. Maybe, maybe just the whole thought of getting married. And you finally received that whatever it was that you were looking for and you came to the realization that this isn't all that I expected it to be. It's not what I expected. Our lives are filled with situations that didn't turn out the way that we expected or hoped that they would. Even as Christians, there are... Um, A lot of people who've made some serious commitments to following God uh, that have had some experiences and situations where they'd say, God, this this isn't how I thought things would go. God, this isn't what I expected it to be. Disappointment is a, a feeling of sadness or displeasure, which is caused by the non fulfillment of our hopes and expectations. It's a feeling, it's an emotion. Disappointment comes to all of us. Disappointment is universal. There's not one of us that is immune to experiencing uh, disappointment. We're all predisposed to it. We've all been there. If I took a poll today, I know every hand would be raised saying, I've, I've, I've been disappointed in life. I've been disappointed about a lot of things in life. Uh, not only is it universal, it's recurring. It's not just something that uh, happens once and then you're immune it can happen over and over and over again, and in fact, it, it, it does happen over and over again. You can even be disappointed by the fact that you're often disappointed. <laughs> disappointment is, is highly contagious. The discouragement that comes from disappointment um, spreads by casual contact. So you're close to somebody who's feeling discouraged because of disappointments in their lives, and then you become discouraged 
uh, because of the discouragement that's caused by your disappointment, and all of a sudden it just kind of is a cyclical thing. So we can be bummed out because other people are disappointed or discouraged. So I mentioned that the Christmas story has a lot uh, of examples for us to talk, and I could, I could spend days talking about stories from my own life, stories from Scripture. Uh, but today, just with this Christmas series and concluding this series, I want to stay in the, the Christmas story. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. We see the miraculous stories of the conception of John the Baptist and, and um, Jesus himself in, in these stories that we're going to be looking at in Luke 1 and then just a moment in Matthew chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, start with verse 5. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. One day Zechariah was serving God in the temple, for his order was on duty that week. And as was the custom of the priest, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and to burn incense. So here we have... We're introduced to Zechariah and Elizabeth, and it tells us a few things about them. One, they were very old. They were beyond years of conceiving a child, and she was barren. They were, had not been able uh, to conceive a child. They're well over 60 years old at this point, and I'm sure disappointment has flooded into their lives because, you know, to be childless, especially in that culture, uh, was, was a real kind of a mark on your life. Verse 6 says that both of them were righteous in the sight of God. That they observed and were careful to obey all the commands of the Lord. Some versions say that they did it blamelessly. So they weren't people that just go through the motions. They were the real deal. They were serious in their relationship with the Lord. It just so happened that uh, uh, Zechariah, the priest, had been drawn that day of all days by lot. They cast lots to see who would go in uh, and serve that day, and it was Zechariah of all people. And uh, we're going to find out what happens here uh, in, in, in their life. So they continued to pray in their old age for a child. They had no child to carry on their name. They had no child to take care of them in their old age. Um, But God worked something impossible that seems impossible in their lives how many of you have figured out at this point that God doesn't understand or know the word impossible actually God is someone who does impossible things with God all things are possible we find this out in the Christmas story over and over and so God works in this situation but notice that he does it in his own way and in his own time And I think where we often get disappointed is that God isn't doing things our way. And most of the time it seems like he doesn't do it in our timing. God is good. He's always good. And as Pastor Weaver said earlier, he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday that he is today and forever will be. God is good. Let's read on in the story, verse 11. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord." He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. 
So with John the Baptist, there was some great expectation that the angel brought to them. Listen, listen to what, what the angel said. He'll be great in the eyes of the Lord, filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. He will turn the Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man in the spirit and power of Elijah. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. So great expectations about who John would become. I think that people that were in their neighborhood, people that knew John as he was growing up, they would say, now one day that boy is going to be somebody. Because they knew the story about his birth. Someday John's going to be somebody. Scripture doesn't tell us what happened with Elizabeth and Zechariah, but because of their old age when John was born, most likely they had passed on when John began his ministry. But now John is in his 20s, living in the wilderness, dressing in clothes made out of camel hair, and eating bugs and honey. I think now when people saw him, they probably said something like, well, that didn't turn out like I thought it would. (laughs) There's someone that didn't turn out the way that I expected him to. You see, John had just been hanging out in the wilderness. He was disciplining himself He was waiting for the time when God would give him the green light to begin preaching and preparing the way for Jesus. His time in the wilderness, I'm sure, seemed like an eternity to him. Seemed like forever. And part of the reason we don't get what we expect from God is because we think in terms of praying for praying today and getting tomorrow. When God gives us a word, it may take years for it to come to pass. See, we pray and think, if I don't get an answer tomorrow or by next week, then where is God? And he's obviously done wrong to me. But we're not the center of the universe. God is the one who created the world that we live in. God is the one who created us. It's his plan. It's his purpose. He's in charge here. And we belong to him. Change of, change of focus for sure. So at the appropriate time, John comes out of the wilderness and he's preaching up a storm. People come from all over to hear him. People were repenting and turning and giving their lives to God. One day, John saw Jesus and made this proclamation. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John was the forerunner of Jesus and his purpose was to prepare the way for Jesus' ministry. And so John continued to preach, although his crowds began to diminish because the crowds were following after Jesus at this point. Eventually, John finds himself thrown into prison. He made a statement about Herod's wife, who was his brother's wife, and we won't get into all the details there, but Herod had him thrown into prison. John sat in prison for months. He was there for a long time. I wonder if he ever thought, this is not what I expected. might have thought, hey, I know my cousin Jesus could do something about this. He, maybe he could get me out of prison, but never did that ever happen. Eighteen months went by. And I think that many of us would have had a hard time believing that God was in control and that God was managing everything at that point. I wonder, honestly, how many of us would say, you know, after 18 months, I've given up hope. I think sometimes we give up hope after two days, a week. But we're to be people of faith. So 18 months in prison, he was, it was his faith that kept him alive, remembering how God had used him, remembering God's faithfulness to him and to his parents. And I think we can learn that even though our circumstances may not be what we expected, they often are not what we expected. We have to remember the goodness of God even where we are. I'm looking at Barb Kelderman right now, and every time I talk to Barb, and I know she's gone through a lot of health things, but this is, Barb always, always adds something about the goodness of God. I never cease to marvel at the goodness of God. Is that where our attention goes? Because when we realize that God is good, and he's always good, he's not just good part of the time. If he's only good part of the time, he's not good other times, then he's not good at all. So we either believe that he's good, or he's not. 
I believe that John was reminding himself of God's, God's goodness. We like the stories in the Bible where uh, God is working miraculously and they have a good ending, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know those guys that took a stand and they were thrown into the fiery furnace and God was, uh, worked a victory and they came out triumphantly. Daniel, who was thrown into a, a den of lions and God shut the mouth of the lions and protected Daniel. But the Bible also teaches that God sometimes answers prayers in ways that we don't, we don't anticipate. Not everything has a fairy tale ending to it. You see, John ends up losing his life in prison. It was the request of the stepdaughter of Herod who wanted his head on a platter. And that's how it ended for him. How do we, how do we make sense out of that? You might be thinking, that's not what I would expect to happen for a person who had such a call on their life, who had done some amazing things for God, who was so devoted. That's, that's really kind of disappointing to see it turn out that way. John, who took a stand for God, who had the anointing of his, God on his life, who was arrested for telling the truth. You see, when we make a commitment to follow Christ, the important things is that our faith survives our circumstances. Our faith has to be greater than our circumstances. But we are so controlled, it seems like, by what's happening right here and now. We get worried, we get anxious, we get fearful. We have all these emotions that happen because we just don't know what's going to happen. And I understand, as I look out this morning, that there are people who are going through some very, very deep, hard, difficult situations in life. People that are uh, battling cancer family situations, financial, whatever it might be. But when we make that commitment to follow God, our faith has to survive our circumstances. So John never lost the realization that he was a servant in the hands of God and God was taking care of him. Let's look at Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. As you're turning there, I want you to imagine, you've probably thought this before, but What about Joseph's disappointment hearing the words from Mary, Joseph, I'm pregnant? You see, we know that the conception of Jesus was by the Holy Spirit, but Joseph didn't know that yet. And the only conclusion that he could have come to was, who have you been messing around with? This is so disappointing. To say the least, he was disappointed. He was devastated. Maybe this morning you find yourself in a, in a similar situation. Maybe it's a, a broken relationship. Relationship with a spouse or with a child or with your parent. Maybe it's the death of someone that you really love. The pain of loneliness. Maybe it's an illness, a disease, cancer, loss of job, a financial struggle. Maybe you just feel completely empty inside. Your plans have failed. You feel like you've failed, and you're just not satisfied with what life has given you up to this point. Here's what I can tell you. Your disappointments can be turned into into dreams come true. Your disappointments can be turned into dreams come true. Your hurts can become hallelujahs. Your pains can become praise. In Matthew chapter 1, we see God turn Joseph's disappointment into a dream come true. Start with verse 18 of Matthew chapter 1. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. And as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. What was bad news has now become the best news anyone could ever hear. See, Mary was pregnant but not with somebody else's baby. This was the Son of God, the Savior of the world. 
Joseph's worst fear, his greatest nightmare, had now become the fulfillment of his greatest hope. His Mary was carrying the Son of God in her womb. That was a dream come true, not only for him, but for everyone. Matthew uh, 122, all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So the prophet Isaiah had foretold 700 years before this about the coming of Messiah, and now the prophecy had come true. Hundreds of thousands of men in Israel at the time, and Joseph and Mary were chosen. So what had been his nightmare became a blessing. And I'm not saying that every situation has a happy ending, because we all know that that's, that's just not true. But the truth and the promises that we have in the Bible give us hope. It gives us hope. And I think that we give up way too easy when it comes to navigating our disappointments by faith. We give up way too easy. Excuse me. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Listen, I don't know how many of you understand that scripture but that says that we can know it says and we know that God works for the good of those who love him how many of you know that how many of you often forget that because here's the thing if we know and we believe that what scripture says is true that God is working all things together for good he is working for the good of those who love him, then we don't have to doubt or question the circumstances of what's going on. And while we feel that sometimes we might want to be disappointed about something, we've got to re, re, uh, recalculate and recalibrate our minds to think, you know what? God is working this for good. So why would I be disappointed? Because I know that God is at work in my life. He's either at work in my life or he's not. Do you believe that God is working in your life and he's working all things together for your good and for his purpose, according to his purpose for your life? So where does disappointment come from? We have expectations. We have certain expectations that we think this is the way it ought to be. You know what, that's just what our mind, our heart tells us it ought to work out this way. But how many of you have found that it doesn't always work out that way? I'm not saying that we shouldn't have expectations or, or have high expectations, but, you know, Joseph expected a virgin wife, and then she's telling him she's pregnant. How about shattering your dreams at that point? Imagine, I mean, as we try to imagine his pain and his disappointment, but sometimes our high expectations disappoint us only to find that God had an even better plan. How many of you found that to be true? I was disappointed, but I found out later, you know what, God did, God did one better than I could have ever imagined. Disappointment comes from wrong motives. I, I think of Judas, who had joined up the, with the Jesus bandwagon. He knew that Jesus was going to be somebody, and uh, he was going to plan on him building an earthly kingdom and thought that when Jesus became king, he would be somebody in his kingdom. But then Jesus started talking about this other kingdom, and he was talking about you know, in the future, and he realized this kingdom wasn't going to happen here, and ultimately, his disappointment led to him betraying Jesus. Disappointment also comes from our limited perception, and I think this is a big one. We just can't see everything. It's hard for us to see what God sees. You know, the disciples didn't understand that Jesus, the Messiah, had to be crucified. And their limited understanding, crucifixion meant the end. Crucifixion meant defeat. They didn't know that that was all part of God's plan to defeat uh, sin and to redeem us from the slavery of sin. So our limited perception often disappoints us. But our source of di di disappointment could become a blessing if we just hang on. God is at work. He's in control. He has a plan and he has a purpose. 
We've got to believe that by faith and trust him every step of the way. God doesn't change. He's for us. He's with us. And he's working things together for our good. Another reason why, why we become disappointed is because of mistaken priorities. You see, we're often, as humans, looking for comfort and material blessings. But God is more concerned with our character development. We don't, we don't like going through trials. We don't like tests in our life. But God has different priorities. And God has promised that he will use those tests and those trials, uh, those difficulties, and those disappointments as a means for us to grow, to get stronger, to build our faith. We may never understand God's ways and his timing, but we need to trust him. We may never understand his ways and his timing, but we need to trust him and obey him. Last thing is false reliance. It's easy for us to put our trust in things like our job or our bank account, our education, our personal connections or contacts, instead of trusting God. Those things are like building something on sand. And you know if you build something on sand, uh, it's not going to last. It may be here now, but it's not going to be here long. And so our reliance oftentimes disappoints us because we're relying on the wrong things. So how do we overcome disappointment? How can we be resilient and bounce back from disappointment when it comes to our life? I've got a lot of scripture that I'm going to share here with you, and uh, it's not going to be on the screen. So if you've got a pencil and you want to write these, things, write these down and go back to them later, uh, I would encourage you to do so. How can we, how can we uh, overcome disappointment? How can we be resilient uh, to overcome disappointments that come our way? First thing is stay faithful. And by that I mean do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Always the right thing is the right thing to do. Sometimes we try to figure out how we're going to get around this thing, but always the right thing is the right thing to do. Facing the greatest trials and hardships of his life, Job held his ground in faith and declared a statement of faithfulness to God that no matter what happened, he said, though he slay me, talking about God, Yet will I hope in him. God can take my life and it's not going to change my hope. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I referred to them earlier. Choosing between faith and death. The king said, either you bow to my idol or you're getting thrown into the fire. And this is their response. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. They had faith to believe that God could save them. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, We want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the the gold statue that you've set up. So they're saying, look, we believe that God can deliver us and save us from the fiery furnace, but even if he doesn't, it's not going to change what we do. We're not going to bow. We're not going to serve another idol. We're going to serve God. It's the right thing, and it's, it's the right thing that we should do. Joseph, in the Old Testament, was sold by a slave by his brothers at the age of 17 because they just despised him. Thrown into prison because he was falsely accused, and then he was forgotten. All total about 17 years from the time his brother sold him as a slave until we find him as vice president of Egypt with Pharaoh. A lot of disappointment, disappointment after disappointment, but I'm amazed at the faith of Joseph. Comes to the end of Genesis in chapter 50 where his brothers are afraid that he's, he's out to get revenge against them. And, and, and Joseph stands in front of his brothers, and uh, this is what he says in Genesis 50, 20. You intended to harm me. You sold me as a slave because you wanted to hurt me. I mean, their plans were to kill him. They decided to sell him as a slave. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. So what you intended for evil, God used it for good. He saw this. He used it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Way back then, 17 years ago, when you sold me as a slave, God's hand was in it the whole time. And Joseph saw it through to the point where now he is able to provide for his family. What the enemy means for evil, God can turn it around for good because he's always working things together for our good. 
Too many of us find it way too easy to compromise when, when difficulty comes. But to remain faithful is to trust and to follow God's plan. God will never abandon a faithful servant. God will not abandon you in your faithfulness to him. So how do we be resilient? We stay faithful and we build our character. We talked about that before. God's priority is not our happiness. It's for our character to be developed. Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 5. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance and endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation and this hope will not lead to disappointment imagine that all this stuff is leading up to the point where we're not disappointed for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love third thing is that we look to God I know it's valuable for us to have the support of people and to surround ourselves with godly people who will uh, speak into our lives, who will influence us toward the things of God. But ultimately, God is the one who has the solution. I believe that what we do with small groups here and what we're beginning to do in, in a greater way is a good thing, but ultimately, God has the solution. Psalm 118, 8 and 9, it's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in people. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Listen, the government's not our answer. People can speak into our life, but ultimately God is the one that has the answer to our lives. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Hebrews 12, 1 to 3, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. So our disappointments don't have to get us down. We just need to look to God. and Realize all that Jesus went through for us. What we go through pales in comparison. Actually, it's nothing like what Jesus went through for us. But we can look to him and realize, okay, I can do this. We find our fulfillment and satisfaction in our relationship with God. That's another way that we overcome disappointment psalm 23 i don't know how many of you have that memorized we often think psalm 23 is just a passage of scripture say for funerals but listen psalm 23 can be a life thing for every one of us and before i read this i want to just challenge you there's a there's a handout on the round table as you go out in the center of the foyer and it's psalm 23 with some blanks filled in and every time there's a pronoun I challenge you to take this sheet and fill your name in there and read this every day. So when it says the Lord is my shepherd, I would say the Lord is Jeff's shepherd. Jeff lacks nothing. Jeff needs nothing. And I mean, you'll start to hear, we did this with my Wednesday night class and I think it's an amazing, gives you an amazing perspective of what God is doing and what his plan and purpose is for your life. Listen to Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. You can't read that without realizing that God loves you and has so much, go- you have so much going for you. You've got nothing to fear, nothing to be afraid of, nothing to be disappointed because God is always with you and he's working in your life. 
Psalm 37, 3 to 7, take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desire. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and, this, and he will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn. The justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18, even though the fig trees have no blossoms, And there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will trust in the Lord. Yet I will trust in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. If we've lost everything, yeah, we may be disappointed. We still have hope. We still have salvation. We still have Christ. I'm going to invite the uh, worship team to come. The last thing in how to overcome disappointments, how to be resilient when we are experiencing disappointment is just to keep the big perspective. I think this is is a, a big thing for us. And this is what Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, our present troubles are small and won't last very long. What we're experiencing here in this life, you know what, life, life is pretty short. And what we're experiencing here in the big picture of things is pretty small. And it's short. It won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and, I, and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. Sometimes we just need the big perspective. Actually, all the time, I think we need the big perspective. You see, you and I, we can't see past the walls of this room. You walk outside this building and you will see as far as the trees or houses can can let you see. You can't see the big picture. I'm convinced that we need to fix our eyes on Jesus the one who is the author, the one who has a plan, the one who has a purpose, because he knows exactly where he wants us to be. And how am I going to get there if I'm not listening to him and I'm not fixing my eyes on him? I've got to get the big perspective. A lot of times people will come down here and and pray. I mean, when I'm praying with them, I'll, I'll I'll just say, you know what, here's an opportunity. Because we get so wrapped up in that situation that we can't see beyond it and i'm thinking you know what let's let's just thank god not i'm not saying let's thank god because we have a disease i'm not saying let's thank god because we have cancer but we're to give thanks in all circumstances let's give thanks to god because here's an opportunity for him to move here's an opportunity for god to work here's an opportunity for him to show himself strong your situations your disappointments your circumstances are opportunities for god to work. It's an opportunity for you to again fix your eyes, to look to him, to realize that he's the answer. Your friends aren't the answer. Your money's not the answer. Your social status isn't the answer. It's Jesus. We need to fix our eyes on him. Our disappointments, our problems, our human limitations, they have a lot of benefits. They remind us first of all that Christ suffered for us. What we're going through is just we're just following after him. They keep us from pride, keeps us from being pr- having pride in ourselves. It causes us to look beyond our life, this brief life, and have an eternal perspective. Actually, what we go through here is, is earning for us and working toward us an eternity. It proves our faith to other people. So when we have those situations, guess what? People are looking. And if I'm going through some kind of a struggle, I'm going through something that's, that looks like it sh- I should be disappointed, but I'm not and I'm putting my faith and trust in God, that's going to be seen by other people. What better way to be a witness than to say, I trust Jesus. I trust him with my life. And again, it gives God an opportunity to demonstrate his power. Here's what I think. We have a generation of people that expect everything to be done for them. It's like the world revolves around me. I 
think a lot of times in Christianity and our faith, it's the same way. We expect, God, you're here for me. And I'm going to tell you something, and you better do it now, and you better do it this way, or else I'm going to be disappointed. He's not, he's not there for us. I mean, he is there for us. We're not, we're not here for him. He, he's there for us. Does that make sense? Let's turn our disappointments in an opportunity to give God praise. Disappointing things will come. We live between this area of expectation and reality, and oftentimes disappointment comes. But I'm saying let's this, this Sunday, January 5th, 2020, the first Sunday of a new year, let's, let's determine to be people of faith, that we're going to walk in faith. We're not going to be dis- disappointed. We're just going to turn it back to, God, you're in control. God, I'm, I'm putting my life in your hands. How many of you can do this? How many of you say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a person of faith. And I'm going to say this year, 2020, is going to be a new year of faith for me. If that's you, would you just stand where you're at? And you say, I'm going to take this challenge that I'm going to turn it back to God and say, God, you're in control of my life. I'm giving my life to you so that you can have your way in me. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give in to discouragement, to disappointments, but I'm going to trust you, God. Father, this morning as we come and we stand before you today, help us not be and live like entitled Christians, like this is owed to us or we deserve this. And if not, God, we're just going to throw in the towel and give up. I pray that we would be determined more than ever to put our faith in you, our trust in you, that we're going to follow you, and that no matter what comes our way, that we can say, as James said, I consider it pure joy when I face trials, when I face tests, because, God, you're working in my life. And I believe that you're working all things together for good in my life, fulfilling your purpose in my life. I believe, God, that you're always with me, that your love never ends and that there's nothing that can separate me from your love. You are good and you're always good. So Lord, we put our faith and our trust in you as a church, as, as families, as individuals. We're going to put our trust in you. And when the enemy would like to bring disappointment our way, we're going to turn it back to, to faith and we're going to trust you, God, and believe that you are working even when we can't see what you're doing. Even when we don't feel that you're doing something, God, we know that you are because your word says that's who you are. We believe you and we believe your word. We believe your report, not what we see. We don't live by sight. We walk by faith. Faith in you, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you this morning need need God to be a miracle worker in your life. You need a miracle from the Lord. You need God to make a way in a situation that only God could do. Just by raising your hand saying, that's me. Would you join and pray with the people around you this morning? And let's by faith believe that God is going to work miraculously in the lives of everyone that has a hand raised. Father, we call on you today, the one who works miracles in our life, the one who makes a way where there doesn't seem to be a way, the one who keeps his promises. Your word gives us promise after promise after promise. And we stand on your word today and say we are healed because of what Jesus did for us. We say, God, you will make a way where there doesn't seem to be a way because you're a God who can move mountains out of the way. God, you can do all things. Impossible is not in your vocabulary. And so today, no matter how impossible our situation seems, no matter how discouraging or disappointed we've been, God, our faith today is in you. It's an opportunity, God, for you to show yourself big, show yourself strong, show yourself to be God. And even if it doesn't work out the way we want it to be, it's okay because it's not our plan. We're not the one in control. You are. And you know what's best. You know what's best for us. And you have plans for us. And we want your plans for our life, not our own. So we'll keep looking to you and trusting you and following you and putting our faith in you. And when the enemy wants to bring discouragement and doubt and disappointment to us, God, we're going to turn it to faith. And we're going to turn it to worship and to to you, God. We're going to give you thanks because of who you are. You are all these things and so much more. 
God, you are faithful and you never change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You love us, God. You said that there's nothing that can separate us from your love. You're a good God. Father, I pray that in this room, if there's someone who hasn't put their faith in you, that today that they would reach out to you and say, yes, God, be the Lord of my life. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Save me and forgive me of my sin. Give me this joy and this hope and this uh, experience that I can have of, of a Savior and a Father who loves me and is always with me and will help me and has an eternity planned for me. God, I pray that you would just come into every heart and every life that's reaching out to you today with your heads bowed and your eyes closed and you'd say, that's me, Pastor Jeff. That's, I, I'm praying that prayer today, inviting Jesus to be the Lord of my life. And you just raise your hand and keep it raised. Looking across the room, I see these hands. Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your salvation. Praise you, Jesus. If today you prayed that prayer and you're making Jesus the Lord of your life for the first time, or maybe you're coming back to him, stop at the Fresh Start Center. It's just right out here, main doors and to the right. We've got some materials that we want to give you to help you in that journey of following Christ. What are next steps? We'd love to talk with you. I'll be out there after the service. So glad that you're here today. Let's make 2020 a year of commitment to the Lord that we're gonna be here, that we're gonna be people of faith, that we're gonna be people of faith tomorrow on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in school, wherever we go, that we're gonna say, God, whatever situations come my way, I'm gonna use it as an opportunity to turn it to faith and see you work in my life. Let's believe God for great things this year.